thanks, Lucy. Uh, I appreciate Sierra Sierra Circuits for for making the uh, presenting the opportunity to to be with you today, and uh, we look forward to an interactive presentation uh, around the topics of SI for embedded computing applications. Uh, before we start getting into SI, uh, I'm assuming that many of you are familiar with SAM Tech, but just in case you're not, um, we wanted to just take a minute or two and, and talk about where SAM Tech is as a company. Um, we've been around uh, in the business for nearly 50 years. Um, we started out back in the mid 70s, focusing in on providing uh, standard and custom uh, 2.54 millimeter or 0.1 inch uh, pin and plastic pins and headers. And our uh, business has evolved to the point now where we're one of the premier players in providing high performance uh, interconnect solutions across a number of industries. And what's really focused, you know, what really enabled that pivot was coming out of the tech downturn at the, at the beginning of this millennium, which seems like yesterday for some of us, uh, we started to see a trend where uh, the speeds of interconnects were, were no longer following the speeds of semiconductors, but there was a, a, a pivot point where inter, the, the interconnect company, Samtech included, started leading the semiconductor industry and performance. And that's really been enabled by what we call the technical renaissance, right? Uh, we see a number of catalysts for, for change, uh, 5G, 6G networks, high performance computing, obviously the uh, pivot within AI ML over the last couple of years, especially you know with chat GPT, that's sort of awakened the public's awareness of where AI is going. And then automotive 2.0 with, with electrification, not only with EVs, but also with the number of, of with the, with the uh, increase in content of uh, semiconductors within uh, automobiles. I, you know, I, I heard a data point recently that 10 years ago, there was roughly $300 worth of semiconductors in an average car. And within the next three to five years, we expect that to be, you know, two to $3,000 worth of semiconductors within it in a new car. So all of those, those trends are really driving what we call the technical renaissance and, and, and focuses in on SAM tech enabling silicon to silicon solutions. So our, our whole focus as a company is, is routing data from point A to point B from a transceiver to receiver as, as cleanly and as efficiently as possible, whether that's in the copper, the optical or the wireless domain. So when you look at, excuse me for one second, Sorry, I've been fighting a head cold and uh, we'll do the best we can not to let that interrupt us anymore. I apologize. But anyway, um, when you look at silicon to silicon connectivity for SAMTEC, we really, really look at the solutions that we offer from the front panel to the back plane. Um, and, you know, whether that's high performance IO, our patented flyover technology, which is basically getting the signal out of the PCB and into uh, an ultra low performance, or excuse me, an ultra low skew high performance 224 gigabit twin axe cable, high speed mezzanine, high speed arrays, uh, wireless or industry standards. We really have just about any interconnect that you need from front panel to back plane in the copper optical or wireless domain. And this just provides a little more detail in terms of the solutions. It is an eye chart. This, I promise this is the only product, this is really the only two or three product slides that we have throughout the presentation. But hopefully, if this is the first time that you're hearing from SamTech, you'll see that as a interconnect solutions provider, um, we can work with you to support any type of custom, customized or off-the-shelf solution uh, when it comes to your high-performance uh, needs. Um, but, you know, the question comes up, that's great, but signal integrity and embedded, I'm not talking about data centers. You know, data center, state of the art is 224 gigabit per second solutions. In embedded, I'm just trying to go from one megabit to 10 megabit, or, or I'm trying to go from one gigabit to 10 gigabit. You know, are, are the SI challenges that the data center folks see at 224 the same that I'm going to see it embedded? And of course not, because there's going to be different rules and, and different different techniques that, that are used there. But the same basic principles apply. So, you know, we're going to talk about that for our uh, presentation today. So, you know, I, I borrowed this 
I borrowed this illustration from one of our FAEs, and I, I think that it meets the, uh, you know, really makes the uh, argument in terms of how important SI is. And, you know, if any of you have listened to me make presentations before, I'm not an SI engineer, but I play one on TV, and, and I love pop culture. So I apologize for the, 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 the transformer pun, but it makes sense, right? More than meets the eye. So, you know, if our channel is open and we have a good open eye, both in terms of eye height and eye width, like on the left, everything's great, right? We don't have to worry about it. We did our, our job as a design engineer or as an SI engineer, everybody's happy. But if our eye diagram looks like on the right and our signaling is within, you know, overlapping of our, of our, 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 our guide, you know, now we've got some problems. How are we going to solve, how are we going to solve that? Well, if you're, new to SI, like I was before I came to SAMHSA eight and a half years ago, there's all sorts of parameters, there's all sorts of uh, techniques, there's all sorts of theory that you have to understand that often doesn't get taught in undergraduate electrical engineering programs that helps you to understand the basics of SI. So typically when SAMTEC brings on an, an engineer, an SI engineer, there's usually about a two to three year process that they go through to, to, to become uh, an SI engineer that we will put in front of customers. So we're going to try to condense that down to about 45 minutes and see how we can address SI, especially in embedded systems. So when we look at SI, it's not just at any one component. Um, SAMTEC looks at signal integrity holistically. Um, we look at it from the transmitter all the way to the receiver on any signal path. Now on, you know, for, for conversations, you know, for the, for the, for use case here, you know, we're showing a transmitter on a, on a motherboard with two coplanar connectors going to a component board to a receiver on the other side. That channel could be board to board. This could be on the same PCB. This could, you know, those connectors could be cables. But when you look at that channel holistically, there's a number of subcomponents that are part of it. So it's not just the transmitter at the silicon, but it's also, you know, how does that, how does that signal get, get from the die down to the substrate, down to the, the, the IC package, um, you know, going from the package through the, the solder ball down to the PCB. How's that, tr that signal go to the PCB trace on the PCB? How many layers does it go through? Are there vias, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it gets to a connector. Breakout region, you know, BOR is a SAMTEC term for breakout region. Um, uh, other terms you may have, have term you have heard related to that may include the signal launch, but how does that connect? How does that signal get into or out of the connector? How does it pass through the connector? Uh, you know, the same thing on the backside. I have the breakout region on the receive board, the PCB trace, the package, the substrate, the die, and then the receiver itself. So there's any number of components, subcomponents across the whole channel that affect the entire signal integrity uh, of, of, the, uh, the, of the challenge that you're working on. So we're gonna try to look at, we're gonna try to define each of these in detail while also going into some of the basic SI parameters um, that can help you to troubleshoot, at least initially, uh, some of the uh, SI challenges you may face and then also you know, the resources that may be available to help you do that. So, you know, when I came to SAMTEC, I just sort of assumed high speed were all digital zeros and ones and signals were perfect um, because that's kind of the, what I dealt with in the earlier part of my career when, you know, dealing at megabits, per, you know, megabits per second or maybe a few hundred megabits per second. Um, however, you know, when I came to SAMTEC, I started getting into 28, 56, 112, now 224. And you start to realize that those digital signals um, obviously have frequency components in them. So one of the terms I was reintroduced to um, here at SAMTEC is Nyquist rate or Nyquist frequency. Kind of forgot about that from my undergrad years. But the Nyquist rate is, designed as, is defined as the frequency that's twice the bandwidth, or typically frequency is, is twice the bandwidth in high-speed designs. Right, the majority of the signal energy is at Nyquist, although many other frequency components exist to create a digital signal. Um, so if you look at the illustration there on the right, the upper right, you know, that shows a realistic zero to one transition, a one to zero transition, but you're also going to have 
excuse me a second. I apologize, the central is driving me crazy. Anyway, um, you're going to see these transitions that are going to be driven by rise time, right? And, and rise time, obviously, traditionally defined as, you know, the transition from, you know, if you're going from zero to 3.3, .3, you know, 10% of that signal to 90% of that signal. The, the faster the rise time, the faster the fall, the, the fall time, the more frequency component that you're going to have. Um, you're also going to have potentially noise on the system, overshoot, undershoot, uh, and the like. Uh, plus the fact that you look at the pulse duration uh, of the signal. So it's not just a pure DC component. It's not perfect going from zero to VCC or from VCC to zero, but you're going to have frequency components in it that add to the noise. Um, in addition, we start to look at what type of signals we have. Are you know, there's single-ended signals, there's, there's differential. We'll talk about those in just a moment. Single-ended signals, single point-to-point -point connection requires the ground reference to return current to the source, prone to noise, Obviously, single-ended signals are, are very prevalent in a number of embedded designs. Uh, a number of standard protocols across the embedded ecosystem, SDI, Coax Express, RS-232, I2C, SPI, RF control signals all take advantage of uh, single-ended solutions. Um, but does that mean that we can run single If we want to run, if we want to run tens of gigabits or hundreds of gigabits per second, does that mean that we look at single-ended? More often than not, when you when you get above a certain performance rate, you're going to turn to differential pairs. And the reason you look at differential pairs is because of the inherent structure of the transceivers and the receivers help to eliminate noise in the system. Uh, differential pairs were introduced to create coupling immunity on transmission lines. You can see here uh, you have a source, you have a pulse on the plus and minus subtractor, you get an output pulse. Um, it does require two X the amount of conductors, so that is a drawback uh, requiring extra space. But it's it's such standard practice in high-speed communication, especially embedded, that it's just become the norm. Um, on the other side, if you do get noise on both the positive and the minus, the subtractor, the comparator, if you will, uh, removes the noise from the system. So. It's not a foolproof, it's not a foolproof, and it's not just as easy going from single ended to differential pair, but as you get higher and higher speeds, differential pair signals obviously provide uh, inherent uh, signal integrity improvements over single and its signals because of the uh, the principles that we just showed. Similarly, um, you know, additional advantage is differential pair. Because a positive negative signal are transmitted, the net current is zero. There's no return line uh, required. Again, you can see here that you have a pulse train. There's also some noise, uh, but when you pass it through, uh, when you pass it through um, the circuitry, the noise is removed from the system. Um, differential pairs are used to cancel common mode noise. So it doesn't eliminate all noise in the system, which we'll talk about. We'll look at some other techniques uh, that can help us to do that, uh, but uh, it does help. It's also important to keep differential pairs close together so that they couple uh, the same noise. Sorry, there's a typo there. Somehow I messed that up. So we talked about single ended. We've talked about we've talked about differential pairs. Something else we want to talk about too is is, is impedance matching. Um, and how that affects signal integrity. If you look at this uh, basic uh, circuit, uh, we want to make sure that the, in essence, the the load of the, the the impedance load is the same as the impedance of the source. Matching the source load gives the maximum power uh, possible power output, which uh, equals high efficiency. Um, you want to make sure that the impedance of the RLC circuit on the source is the same. Excuse me, on the load is the same as the source. Matching for SI involves balancing the impedance. Um, there's going to be, you know, we'll talk about this as we go forward, but throughout a signal channel that we've talked about holistically going from the transmitter to the receiver, in an ideal world, it's all the same impedance, but you don't have ideal impedance matching across a real world channel. Um, so you're going to have mismatches, but it's how do you minimize those mismatches? When you do have the impedance mismatch, lower power due to, uh, mismatch in high-speed circuits can cause issues or not. Um, what does that mean? We'll, we'll cover that as we go forward. Uh, 
these two sh these two um, graphs show uh, how you can have impedance mismatches within the system. Um, this is using uh, TDR, time domain reflectometry, basically sent a, a pulse down the signal, and then as it comes back, you, you measure the, 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 the impedance of the channel uh, using TDR signal, signal, signal sections. The um, channel on the left uh, shows an example of two TDRs in a PCI system, one at 85 ohm, one at 100 ohm. Uh, the physical locations on the bottom of the graph, their subsequent effect on the characteristic impedance. The graph shows larger discontinuities at, at 100 ohms. Um, you may ask, well, what's the difference between 185 ohms? And, and depending upon the protocols that you look at, there, there are a number of protocols that are 100 ohm impedance. There's PCI uses 85 ohm impedance. Um, but you can see how impedance mismatches can really affect your TDR. Um, TDRs are never going to be flat because there's always going to be discontinuities when a signal leaves the source and then goes through the interconnect. So when you look at, uh, you know, all this movement here in the beginning, tend to not pay attention to that, but this is bad. You know, so when you see TDR changes further along the signal, you want to minimize that. And this helps us to see why in a number of cases, 85 ohm routing is preferable, but not every system uses it. Um, so this is using a standard PCI Express form factor. Obviously that is, uh, you know, PCI Express interconnect have been on the market for 15 to 20 years. Um, they're uh, a standard point one millimeter connector uh, using standard FR4 material because we won't cost high volume. But when you look at the, uh, when you look at the uh, graph on the right, the difference is, you know, looking, this is an example, we use a Samtech Novaray connector. Samtech Novaray was designed specifically, specifically for differential pair high speed at 112 and 224. It has very good crosstalk, it has very good, it was designed for high speed differential pairs. So when you look at TDR, it has a intrinsic impedance of 92.5 ohms. Um, it's, it's much flatter uh, in terms of TDR response. You're gonna have better impedance matching on this interconnect than making the transition from a PCI Express connector to a PCB uh, because of the fact that it's designed for higher speeds. But the key takeaway from these, uh, the, t the key takeaway from this slide is that impedance mismatch you lose power in the system it adds uh, attenuation and you want to try to optimize matching with throughout the system as best as possible sorry about that excuse me so so far we've talked about single ended we've talked about differential pairs we've talked about impedance mismatching another key parameter that's necessary to understand uh, signal integrity with embedded applications is insertion loss. Uh, insertion loss is the total amount of power lost through a component expressed in dB. So in, a, in, an, ideal, in an ideal world, um, we talked about how we want to have perfect impedance matching where the impedance of the load equals the impedance of the source. And in that case, you're going to have P out equals P max. However, because of impedance matching, you're going to have, you know, among other factors, you're not going to have that, and that's going to affect insertion loss. Something else that, that, that you may notice, insertion loss is a negative value because you're going from, it's a, it's a ratio of P, P max to P out. But in SI, it's typically expressed as a positive value. Um, when looking at that from an S parameter's perspective, S21 is the typical desired S parameter for insertion loss and is normally equivalent to S12. Uh, Too much insertion loss leads to bit errors due to uh, low voltage. Um, insertion loss is a, is a general uh, ca catch all for, is a general catch all for a number of losses throughout the system. Uh, these losses can include reflection loss, coupling or radiated loss, dielectric loss, or uh, conductor loss as well. What does this look like in a real system? You can look at the next slide and it'll help us to see that. 
um, you know, we tend to look at Samtech, you know, we tend to look at, you know, as, as a connector manufacturer, as a connector manufacturer, Samtech tends to look at uh, insertion loss. Excuse me one second. I'll be back in just one moment. I apologize for the, the, the delay here. Uh, Matthew, we can't hear you anymore. Sorry about that, folks. I apologize for the delay. Um, anyway, what we're talking about in terms of insertion loss, since Samtech is an inter interconnect manufacturer, one of the things that we tend to focus in on is insertion loss, specifically at the connector. We also will look at it uh, holistically over the over the channel, like we mentioned uh, earlier. So, when you know, a question that we get uh, from a number of our customers is, "What's the typical insertion loss for a channel?" And a lot of times we say it will depend. Um, how long is the channel? What type of protocol are you looking at? Et cetera, et cetera. But in general, we tend to look at um, anytime you have a dB, an insertion loss about 5 dB, uh, you're in good shape. However, it really depends upon the application. Why can we say that? Well, if you look at uh, a number of typical compute engines that are popular with embedded applications, high power, high, high power switches and FPGAs, can handle insertion losses of 30 to 35 dB. Uh, so it's it's really relative depending upon uh, the channel. Something else about insertion loss, it's nonlinear uh, over frequency. For short traces, insertion loss is due to a poor match. For longer channels, insertion loss is typically due to uh, attenuation. So again, looking at these, uh, looking at these uh, IL plots on the right-hand side, you can see that there's difference in performance based on interconnect types chosen. The one on the top is uh, taken from a uh, older connector style. You can see that it has relatively clean insertion loss out to about 14 to 16 gigahertz. There is, a, there is some resonance there around eight to 10 gigahertz um, that, would, that would cause a challenge. But if you're operating with a Nyquist out to 12 to 14, you should be okay. So that connector, you know, at 14 gigahertz, maybe you call that about a 28 gigabit connector because it's nice and flat uh, out to 14 to 16 gigahertz. However, if you look at the insertion loss of the connector on the bottom, this is this is our uh, insertion loss plot of, of Samtex uh, Accelerate HP interconnect. You'll see that that's nice and flat and clean out to about 30 gigahertz. So the, the, the question comes up, what's the difference? Well, if you're operating... If, if you come to Samtech and say, I need a low cost connector that has good insertion loss at six gigahertz, which is roughly a 12 gigabit per second channel, I'm gonna give you the option one, I'm gonna give you the connector 
in option one because it gives you the IO performance that you need. Obviously, the the uh, Accelerate HP would work too because the frequent the the, op, the the insertion loss is a little bit cleaner, but you're going to pay more for performance. So this helps us to see that when it comes to signal integrity in embedded applications, it's really a function of uh, what the application uh, is. Um, but in general, if you keep insertion loss flat out to a certain frequency range, the interconnect that you choose or the channel that you that, sh that you choose is uh, going to affect uh, the overall performance. So related to that, um, something that we also see, uh, you know, if you have too much insertion loss uh, within your channel, that can affect uh, the rise time of your system. If you look at the, the initial pulse train here on the left, you see a, a, a input of about or an input to output of about 30, 37 picoseconds. However, with the second signal, you can see that that rise time has, has gone out to uh, 116 picoseconds. So that's a, a, a big rise time degradation. So again, what we're trying to illustrate with these points is, is there's a constant trade-off between uh, understanding these SI parameters, insertion loss, return loss, which we'll get to, but how does it affect your system specific to your application? Return loss uh, is another key SI parameter. It's the amount of energy reflected in a channel expressed in DPs. Uh, return loss is really uh, caused by an impedance mismatch, which are in turn caused by discontinuities. When you look at that from an S parameter standpoint, it's S11 or S22 uh, in a two port network. Uh, you can see that return loss is defined as uh, 10 log of PN uh, over uh, P reflected. So is a general rule of thumb, uh, we want to see a return loss margin. We're never, we're never going to have perfect return loss because there's always return loss within a system. But the question comes up is how much return loss can we, can we handle? Uh, and again, it all depends upon use case. In general, uh, when it comes to a channel or a connector, we like to see at least 10 dB, if not more, uh, performance within the connector. So if you look at these graphs got switched. I should have had the one on the bottom on top. Uh, the one on the bottom is one of our legacy interconnects. You can see that it has a nice flat return loss profile out to about 14 to 16 gigahertz. So given the fact that it's below 10 dB, you could probably get 30 gigabit per second out of that connector, plus or minus. If you look at the accelerate connector on top, um, we've got really good clean return loss out to about 26 to 28 gigabit. Um, that gives us confidence that, that that's a 112 gigabit per second connector. So again, use cases, you know, if I'm working on an embedded application, I need really good insertion loss, I need really good return loss, well, what frequency, what Nyquist, or what data rate. Well, if you need just 10 gigabit or 15 gigabit, I'm going to sell you the one on the bottom because it's going to be less expensive. But if you need to get higher data rates, I'm going to sell you the one with the better return loss out to a larger, larger Nyquist frequency so that you can get the performance that you need. How does this help us to uh, make some design design changes or design, design choices within our system? Well, we talked earlier about how too much insertion loss can affect rise time. Um, and the same thing here is if, if you have too much return loss in your system, you can get ring back or, or ringing within the system. So on the left-hand side, you see a very well-matched signal, but the signal on the right-hand side has a uh, mismatched circuit. And you would want to, you obviously you wouldn't want that much ring back or ringing within the system. So you'd want to find where the impedance mismatch is within your signal channel and, and work to uh, eliminate that. So the question comes up, if I am in that circumstance, uh, what are some things that I can do to uh, minimize return loss? Uh, as I mentioned, in digital electronics, which is typically what you're going to find in embedded applications, you're going to, you know, a good acceptable return loss is about 10 dB, minus 10 dB. This represents 10% power reflection, allows for a, amount, a fair amount of mismatch margin, but it also depends upon the system requirements as some receivers are more or less sensitive than others. 
when you start to look at RF, uh, you typically like to look at return losses of, of greater than 15 uh, dB. Uh, and this, this, this is because of the tighter impedance mismatches that are in the system. Um, a good example of that, uh, if, if any of you are working with, um, you know, we talked earlier about how the FPGA transceivers can hand insert, handle insertion losses out to 30 to 35 dB, plus or minus. Um, if you start to look at return loss specs on those, those same, same transceivers, you're going to see on the digital side that return loss is roughly 10 dB. But if you look at the return loss on the RF portions, like a good example is, is uh, not that we're promoting this, this chipset, but if you look at uh, some of the AMD Zinc RFSOC solutions, you know, they have return loss profiles of 15 dB out to, you know, I think the third generation is roughly eight gigahertz. Uh, so looking at the data sheets for the chipsets that you're looking for, you're going to see the SI parameters um, that the chips can handle. And, you know, the data sheets for those, those chips are uh, very good at helping you to decide the signal channel that you can build and how much connector uh, return loss, insertion loss, et cetera, that you can put in there. Something else to, to, to keep in mind when it comes to design tips around return losses, reflections can be dampened by insertion loss. Uh, adding channel length after an area of mismatch can, can, can help a lot. On the other hand, if there's not much margin in the IL budget, uh, good return loss may, be, may mean less energy lost due to reflection uh, and better insertion loss. Um, crosstalk. Uh, this Zoom call is a good example of how we have really good crosstalk because rightly or wrongly, I'm the only person talking. You know, we've got roughly 60 people on this Zoom call and if all 60 of us tried to talk at one time, what would happen? We wouldn't be able to hear anything. It would just, it would sound like a crowd in a, in a, in a, in a ball game. So that illustration helps us to see how we want to avoid crosstalk in the uh, in our embedded circuit design. We don't want to see unwanted noise coupled from one adjacent point to the other. Uh, the illustration there on the left, if you're looking from uh, the, you know the transmit on the left hand side going from uh, you know the impedance on the source to, to the to the impedance on, on the load, you see a nice transition going from zero to one. Some of that noise, if it's you know goes to the adjacent carrier, and that can be either near end or uh, far end crosstalk. So near end crosstalk or next as it's typically uh, described uh, is crosstalk coupled to the transmit end. Far end crosstalk is crosstalk coupled to the uh, receive end. Um, from this parameter standpoint, the example above would be S13 and S23 as we've illustrated on the lower right hand side. This is also the same concept uh, as EMI. Um, in the digital world, uh, the digital ICs can typically handle 30 to 40 dB of, of crosstalk, plus or minus. Um, but again, it depends on system design. We talked earlier about you know, the example of the RFSOCs, the, the, the Zinc, the AMG Zinc RFSOCs. Uh, if you look at the uh, return loss, excuse me, the crosstalk um, specs there, it's close to 70 dB, if not more. So, you know, we're, we're, we start to see kind of two rules of thumb. In the embedded world, on the digital side, you're going to have 10 dB of return loss, 30 to 40 dB of crosstalk. On the RF side, you're going to have 15 dB of uh, return loss and then roughly 70 dB uh, of crosstalk. So, you know, that's why we kind of generalize. When SAMTEC talks about SI parameters, we tend to generalize it um, when given the press, you know, when, 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 when presenting these topics, because, you know, it's, it's the principles apply, but they're always application specific when trying to minimize or optimize the signal integrity within the system. Now, let's start to tie some of this together. Um, I love this illustration because this shows the type of solution uh, or, or the type of effect that you can have uh, from a single uh, differential pair. So all this is showing is a differential pair going to a VIA, going through 
the reference plane down to a trace on the other side of the uh, layer of the PCB. And as the signal goes from you know the, the, the reference plane down to the via, you can see this massive amount of noise within the system, crosstalk, whatever the case may be. What's missing? Well, there's no grounding within the system. Uh, and as a result, the vias act like antennas uh, and that energy could be coupled somewhere with all the system. You and I well know that in modern embedded compute, de uh, compute design, you're not gonna have a single transmit pair and a single receive pair. You're gonna have multiple transmit pairs, multiple receive pairs. So the noise that this illustration shows would, would affect something. So how can we mitigate it? All we did going to this next slide is introduce ground stitching. So this helps you to see how these vias, you know, in, in essence, eat up the energy emitted from the high speed signal. Um, and this is just showing, you know, standard differential pair routing structures, ground signal, signal ground. Um, in, a, in a real world system, you may also add vias uh, all around, depending upon the, the, the layout of the system, uh, this, I see a question came up. I'm just gonna answer this because this is easy. Uh, this was actually taken from uh, Cadence Clarity, but this simulation, could, you know, this is just a, a random example that you could use in, in, in any simulator tool. So Ansys, Cadence, Mentor, or whatever. Uh, Samtech is agnostic in terms of the uh, simulation tools that, that folks use but it does uh, illustrate the point. So the key here is when you have high-speed differential pairs, if you don't put the grounding in, and if you don't use good design technique, you're going to have signal integrity issues. But with just basic uh, rule of thumb, good design practice, you can mitigate the effect of crosstalk insertion loss, return loss, uh, and the like. So we've talked about a lot of things so far in terms of insertion loss, return loss, crosstalk, ground stitching, good PCB design, et cetera, et cetera. What are some rules of thumb that as embedded system designers that we can implement to help us to optimize our S -S -S SI? Well, we're never going to have perfect mismatch, excuse me, we're never going to have perfect, perfect impedance matching in a system, you're going to have some mismatch, but it has to be minimal so as not to affect the system. We illustrated ring back, we illustrated, uh, you know, many different side effects you can have when you don't have good impedance matching. Um, other rules of thumb when it comes to IL, typical receivers handle five to seven, high end FPGAs are, or, uh, you know, modern uh, Certes solutions can handle 30 to 35 dB of IL or more. Um, when it comes to digital systems, you're going to have 10 dB of return loss or roughly 40 dB of crosstalk. On, but again, it's application specific because in the RF world, you're going to have 15 dB of return loss, 70 dB of crosstalk. These rules of thumbs are, are, are generalizations. Uh, it really is going to be, you know, but when it comes to your specific application, it really helps to, to, to really hone in on what are the, the SI parameters specifications as defined by the transceiver and receiver uh, specs on the data sheets of the ICs that you choose. And as our listener brought up, you know, simulation is best to help prevent these issues. At a high level though, what are some of the design tips uh, that can improve SI? Insertion loss, use better PCB materials. You know, FR4, FO4R8 is obviously the workforce uh, of the embedded computing ecosystem. Um, but uh, as you get higher speeds, especially above, say, 25 gigabits per second, you know, FR4 has an inherent, uh, has inherent um, uh, dielectric value. So to get better insertion loss, uh, you may have to go to a lower dielectric value uh, PCB material. Maybe that's using a Megtron, maybe that's using a, a Tachyon, maybe that's using an Isla, uh, but that helps to improve performance. 
the other, you know, another solution that we're starting to see more and more, we've seen this in the data center, but we're starting to see it in the embedded world is, you know, Samtech's approaches. We've got our ISP Twinex Samtech flyover cables that have roughly one third of the loss of standard PCB. So our, our thought process is IC PCB connector, put it into the cable domain and you can get the signal to, to uh, route over longer distances using Twinex cable. Um, also improve the design impedance mismatch, less reflection, better insertion loss. How do we minimize return loss? Matching is the key. Uh, we also may want to add insertion loss on the channel to dampen reflections. This You can create more distance between adjacent signals, reduce the capacitance. You can also pull pins between adjacent pairs. You can also look at being single-ended versus differential pair. Uh, design tips to improve uh, SMI, crosstalk EMI, uh, keep aggressive signals away, use strip line instead of micro strip. So inner layer versus outer layer. Obviously the inner layer is going to have additional grounding because you can route the signals between ground planes. Uh, ground stitching uh, and other layout met methods can, can shield your signals. Remember we talked earlier about the effect of just two stitching vias instead of having signal signal with nothing with all that radiating noise on the simulation tool. You can do ground signal, signal ground uh, to help build uh, the, the picket fence uh, around your signal as it goes down to the PCB. Um, you can also tie uh, unused pins to ground to absorb a couple of energy. Um, the more grounding, the better in a general sense. And again, differential pairs at high speed uh, help. At the, end of, at the end of the day, it's all about choosing the right component and a good layout. You know, look at your PCB stack up, look at your VN anti-pad design. Look at the VIA technology, proper routing of your differential pairs and appropriate guard traces uh, and ground stitching. So we've talked so far uh, about uh, good SI parameters in a general sense, um, but can we look at a specific example? And the one case study that we wanna use is Pikmin Com HPC uh, or computer on module for high performance computing. Uh, many of you here may have, have used Com, uh, excuse me, Com E, Com Express. Com Express has been around probably for the better part of 15 to 20 years. But, uh, you know, it has finite performance because of the interconnect being so old. So PICMIG really decided to focus on a new standard to improve the performance uh, for next generation computer on modules, system on modules. So the first spec of Com HPC, you know, moved from PCI 3 which is roughly uh, eight gigabits per second up to PCI-5, which gets you up to 32 gigabits per second. With the latest version of the spec, we've been able to increase the performance of the connector up to 56 or 112 gigabits per second. Um, we've also increased, you know, the, the Pikmin Com HPC uh, technical working group also increased the, the, the number of PCI lanes uh, from 32 up to 64. Uh, more support for 25 gigabit ethernet and updates of other interfaces, including USB 4.0 uh, and multi multimedia uh, solutions. Now the question comes up, Kami works for me, that's great. Um, you don't have to switch over to Kami HPC, but as you, know, you start to see AI and uh, additional intelligence at the edge of the network, Kami uh, HPC allows server grade performance uh, at the edge and extends the server on module uh, idea to embedded applications. So, you know, Samtech, one of the reasons we like to talk about Com HPC is because Samtech does offer Com HPC interconnect solutions. Uh, as we go through the values of this connector, you'll see that it was chosen because it highlights a number of the values that we uh, iterate. When we looked at the values of, of good insertion loss, good return loss, it's actually the same connector family. It's COM HBC, our story HP family. Uh, it can support PCI 6, 100, gig 100 gigabit ethernet, open pin field array, COM HPC uh, defined uh, 400 pin, four by 100 solutions, 0.635 millimeter pitch. The rows are spaced uh, specifically uh, 2.2, 2.4 and 2.2. Uh, which we'll talk about why that's important. It's a small connector in terms of height, five millimeter and 10 millimeter stack heights, as well as um, a small dimension size, roughly 70 millimeter by nine millimeter. Uh, and it can support a, 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 a good amount of power because of the fact that 
embedded server chips have TD, TDPs of up to 150, 150 watts plus the uh, DRAM that would go around to supporting them. So that's all great. The connector sounds good, but how do we know that it's going to be able to support PCI Express 5, PCI Express 6, 100 to give it Ethernet and the lot? So while the connector was being chosen, while the uh, structure, while the, the channels for Plum HPC were being developed, there was a signal in, integrity sub team within the Plum HPC technical working group that looked at the performance of the interconnect, the PCB, the traces, uh, to make sure that they would perform as advertised. So when looking at the various protocols supported by Plum HPC, PCI Express, Ethernet, et cetera, et cetera, determined lost budgets for each of those high-speed interfaces. Uh, there were uh, 3D models, electromagnetic 3D models built and solved to create S parameters of each uh, system component. Uh, those were the, the COMHPC connectors, the PCBs, both the module and the carrier, uh, as well as the differential V and strip line models. And then each of those components were uh, concatenated together to come up with uh, simulation models uh, from transmit on the module down to the receive on the carrier card. Um, results were documented in the specification. We could spend the entire webinar talking about the details of, 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 of these performances, but uh, you can see that all on the Chrome HPC spec available from pickwing.com. So some of the questions here, we're talking about grounding. Um, and what I wanted to show was when it comes to practical high-speed embedded computing design, um, we actually had to make the Com HPC connector bigger from the, the original proposal because we found that we needed additional spacing between the connector rows to get additional grounding pins to support the high-speed data rates that we wanted. So you can see here, we're only showing three rows instead of four, but there's specifically 2.4 mil, uh, meters between the center row and 2.2 meter, millimeters on the outer row. Why was that there? Uh, that allows us to have the ground signal signal ground, ground is the green, signal is obviously the red, but we're able to add additional vias, um, not only around the signal pins, uh, but also down the row between uh, the connector pins as well. So by adding more ground vias, by stitching these together on the uh, ground layers, the copper cores, it reduces crosstalk and eases a differential route. So this, this goes to show some of the trade-offs that you may have to take. I want a slim connector, but if I use a 2.2, 2.2, 2.2, I may have more crosstalk, but if I increase the space between the, the pin rows to get more grounding vias in, that minimizes the crosstalk, which allows me to get higher data rates. Uh, so that was actually one of the design changes to the connector that was made from the original proposal to what was finally adopted within the specification. So what's this look like? Um, talking about insertion loss, when you look at the connector, both the five millimeter and the 10 millimeter, we've got nice flat insertion loss way out to 35 to 40 gigabits per second. So that tells us that using, you know, 100, 112 gigabit PAM4, Nyquist at 28 gigabit, you've got insertion loss somewhere around 0 0.4, 0 0.5 dB. If you're looking at PCI 6, that's 64 gigabit per second, PAN 4, 16, gig, 16 gigahertz Nyquist, really flat insertion loss, should work nice and cleanly. Same thing on the return loss at 16 gigabit, you've got return loss way in excess of 10 dB. At 28, 28 gigabit, you've got return loss way above 10 dB. So again, you're good both at PCI 6 and at 100 gigabit Ethernet speeds. Now you say, that's great, that's for the connector, but what about the, the connector plus the BOR, the footprint on the PCB? And same thing, 16 dB, PCI 5, PCI 6, you're still around you know, 0.75 to 1.25 dB insertion loss, no problem. Um, return loss, 16 gigabit, greater than 10 dB, you're fine for PCI 5, PCI 6 as well. 
So lots of details here um, in terms of uh, signal integrity. Uh, it's hard to collapse all this information into one webinar, but we hope that you benefit from the information that we presented so far. So some of the key takeaways from our presentation today, Samtex uh, offers a global team of SI technical experts, online design tools, and world-class customer service to support any high-speed embedded application team. We have over 80 SI engineers that work for Samtech around the globe. They're available 24-7. Um, again, I'm not a signal integrity engineer. I just play one on TV, but we do have signal integrity engineers that are available to help you with your SI challenges uh, and your designs. Just contact us, and, and they're more than happy to help you work through those problems case by case. We've only talked about one or two connectors, but we offer a comprehensive portfolio of high-performance interconnect solutions, ideally suited for embedded applications. A lot of this is targeted uh, at system on modules, computer on modules, or high speed board to board. Uh, we have a number of families that are found uh, across a number of embedded, embedded computing platforms uh, in those areas. One of the new tools that we've recently released, and, and I think we made this available through the CR Circuits uh, online community, is our Signal Integrity Handbook. Uh, this is a 32 page guide that, that offers a deeper dive into the basics that we talked about very briefly during our webinar, uh, that's available online on the Samtech website, samtech.com slash SIG. Uh, and you can contact our signal integrity experts at SIG at samtech.com as well. Um, I want to apologize for uh, the disruptions of our webinar today. I've been over, I've been fighting a cold the last couple of days and I thought I'd get rid of it by today. Uh, so I apologize, thank you for your patience there. Um, but let's see if we can't answer uh, the question as well. Um, how do you calculate the bits per second based on the bandwidth of the IL and the RL? That's a good question. Um, there's equations for that that are in the signal integrity handbook. Uh, I forget what those are off the top of my head. I apologize that I can't an answer that directly uh, on the presentation. But uh, if you email me that, I can um, get that back to you. Uh, or you can contact our signal integrity engineers as well. Typically, <clears throat> what, what, let me answer that question in a different way, though. When we were going through the presentation using the general rules of thumb, is if you're telling me I've got PCI 6, I wanna, I've got a PCI 6 signal, I want to run through a channel. So according to PCI SIG, um, the insertion loss over an entire PCI Express 6.0 signal is 32 dB. So if my insertion loss across the entire channel is less than 32 dB, the likelihood that you can support that data rate through that channel is, is pretty good. Same thing, they have a re return loss spec, which I forget what that is off the top of my head. But if your channel beats the insertion loss and beats the return loss, you're going to be okay. So there are formulas, um, that are readily find, you know, easy to find that can help you to find the bit rate. But there's also a lot of rules of thumb that make it easy to tell whether a signal or a, you know, whether a channel or an interconnect can support a certain data rate based on key specs. A lot of that just comes with uh, the more experience you get with SI. Hopefully that answers that question. Second question, are the ground vias with a diff pair helping because of the improved return current path? And the short answer to that is yes. Um, the more the more grounding that you get, um, whether that's stitching vias or uh, if your design allows you to have ground planes above and above and below, uh, the more grounding you have, the better. Um, you know, inherently, you know, we talk about digital signals, but inherently, even if you're talking about high speed uh, differential pairs, there's still analog signals passing through the PCB. So. Um, we need to make sure that our grounding is, is good. We need to make sure that our PCB design is good. We need to make sure that the uh, via styles that we use, the anti-pad design that we use uh, are optimized for our specific application. Again, since I'm playing an SI engineer on TV, I don't have the expertise to give you all that data, but if you have an application specific solution and if you contact our SI experts, they can walk through that on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Uh, so great question. Um, 
was the point of stitching vias to have ground around the radiators? Would that be equivalent to having a ground pour? Um, if you're using a, so the short answer is, is yes. Um, if you have a uh, two layer, four layer board, obviously the, the ability to use ground stitching uh, is going to minimize the effect uh, that it has. Typically what we find though in high speed digital designs is you have very complex stack ups with multiple signal layers, multiple ground layers uh, and the like. So uh, you also have hidden vias, you have, you have back drilled vias, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the rules of thumb that we talk about are focused on a more complex design but the listener brings up a good point. If I'm only using a two layer or four layer, four layer board, you know, having a ground pour is going to do the same thing. So it's a great, great question. Strip line. Why is strip line better than micro strip? Um, it, again, it's going to depend upon the application because there's a number of uh, factors that, that, that go into that. But the general thought process is if, if I'm running a, if I'm running a trace, through the middle of the PCB that has a ground layer on top, a ground layer on bottom, you know, above it and beneath it, and I tie tie those together with stitching vias or along the trace, you're going to get a much better grounding versus, versus just something on the top layer or the bottom layer that's going to have grounding on the side. So try to think three-dimensionally that if I have an internal layer, internal layer solution, I'm going to have more grounding around the signal in effect, you know, building a, uh, a, uh, a waveguide, in essence, um, on the PCB to help with grounding the signals. Uh, you have not talked about via stubs. That's correct. Uh, it's hard to cover all every aspect of SI within 60 minutes, um, but we have SI specialists that can talk about, about via stubs uh, all the time. Obviously, you want to minimize via stubs because those can, uh, or, or just stubs in general, because those can uh, affect the uh, performance of the system um you know when doing that with vias uh obviously if you have your signal come in on the top layer you have your signal going out on a mid layer and the via goes from the top layer down to the bottom layer um you know that via from the middle of the board down to the bottom of the board acts as an antenna uh one of the ways to get rid to get rid of that is to use back drilling and that makes the via go from the top layer down to the signal layer um so yeah that's a great point by the listener and you want to eliminate stubs as much as possible. So great question. Okay, Lucy, I think that you covers know. everything. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much for doing this webinar with us. Thank you to everyone who joined. I will send you the slides and recording by the end of the day. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your patience with me. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye -bye.